All right, I think we'll get going here. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Jason Barabas. I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences. And I want to welcome you to the 2022 Brooks Family Lecture. Uh, the Brooks Family Lecture Series was established in 1990 by Babbert Brooks of Westport, Connecticut. Mr. Brooks graduated from Dartmouth in 1947, and he also took a degree from Tuck in 1949. The Brooks Family Lecture Fund helps us bring distinguished guests, guests to campus to deliver a public lecture, to participate in class visits, and to meet informally with students and faculty, all with the goal of fostering a balanced discussion on campus of national and international issues. Uh, over the years, we've had many distinguished past guest lecturers, including New Hampshire Governor and Senator Judd Gregg, William Kushtel, Mark McClellan, David Brooks of the New York Times, Professor Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute, now with uh, JFK School at Harvard. Uh, we've also had several alumni come and give Brooks family lectures, including Mort Kondracki of class of 1960, Paul Gigot of class of 1977, and Laura Ingram of class of 1985. Uh, adding to the list of past Brooks family lecturers from Dartmouth, it is an honor to welcome back to campus a member of the class of 1988, Alex Azar. I will introduce him, but that will not be easy given his vast experience in the public and private sectors. Uh, but here's a brief synopsis. Uh, Alex Azar served as the 24th Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services. That acronym is HHS. You're gonna hear it quite, an, quite a lot today. Uh, in the Trump administration and from 2018 onward. He's leading over 80, 80, 85,000 employees with a budget of over 1.4 trillion. And that's the largest budget of any cabinet department, not just in the US, but worldwide. Uh, he was the architect of Operation Warp Speed, delivering COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics in record time. And his lecture tonight will be focused mainly on that, uh, that project and experience. But briefly, the Project Warp Speed team developed a public-private in partnership with the biopharmaceutical industry through which hundreds of millions of Americans were vaccinated within one year of the inception of the program. This has been and remains one of the top public policy and public health challenges of our generation. Alex was... Uh, spearheading the US response, but he's also been involved in a number of other high profile issues, including the opioid, opioid crisis response, public-private partnerships with respect to insurance options, drug pricing, public health initiatives on banning of uh, flavored e-cigarettes, uh, efforts to tackle the HIV epidemic, and rural health care, among others. Secretary Azar actually had two stints at HHS in different administrations. First, under the George W. Bush administration, he was general counsel and then deputy secretary of HHS in the mid-2000s. And in this position, he was the number two official and the chief operating officer of this very important agency. I should note also, um, this is a position that Nelson A. Rockefeller, our namesake, held um, many years ago as the undersecretary of health, education, and welfare, Hugh, uh, the forerunner uh, version of HHS in the Eisenhower administration. As I mentioned, Secretary Azar will be talking about Operation Warp Speed, and that's a public-private uh, partnership. And so it may come as no surprise to know that he was also in the private sector and has vast experience there, specifically at Eli Lilly, uh, a global pharmaceutical company where he served in multiple roles, including president of Lilly, the largest affiliate of Eli Lilly. At Dartmouth, Azar graduated in 1988 with a summa cum laude distinction in government and economics. Then he went on to earn a law degree from Yale University in 1991. After law school, he clerked for Associate Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court of the United States. He's currently an adjunct professor of business and senior executive in residence at the University of Miami in their business school, and he also serves on a number of corporate and civic boards. Perhaps most importantly, he's the parent of two Dartmouth students, um, and it is a pleasure to welcome back to Dartmouth, Alex Azar. Now, the, the format of this will be that we, we have remarks from Secretary Azar and then Q&A from the live audience here, as well as the live streamed audience at, um, beyond this auditorium. And I will ask some questions and we'll open it up more broadly. Now, I want to encourage also people from, that are watching uh, the live stream version of this to submit their questions to rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. And with that, I want to uh, turn it over to Secretary Azar. Thank you. Professor, thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's a real delight to be here for the Brooks family lecture. I want to thank the Brooks family. I don't know if we have any of the members of the family here tonight, but, uh, but do want to express appreciation for endowing this lecture series. And it, for me, is a, is a real honor 
to be doing something in, conjun in conjunction with the Rockefeller Center because during my time, you heard my majors, government and economics, I pretty much lived in Silsby and the Rockefeller Center and took advantage of just so many incredible programs that Rocky put on and got to meet so many interesting people. And so for me to now, 30 many years later, to be part of that is, is a delight. Um, we're gonna do a little journey back in time uh, today, which is trying to remember just how bad things were January, February, March, April of 2020. It's easy now in retrospect with so many of us vaccinated, I'm hoping everybody in the room is vaccinated and boosted. It's easy in retrospect when things work, when there is a success, it's easy to look backwards and say that, must, that, that was inevitable, that had to happen. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is how that wasn't inevitable and how through a series of choices and frankly everything lining up and getting you know, lucky and, uh, and things working but setting the preconditions for luck, this worked and we were able to now have the majority of the American population vaccinated, billions of people around the world vaccinated uh, and hopefully on track to even more. So let's Let's step back and think about the challenge. We've, I'm gonna give you, you're gonna learn more about vaccines tonight than you ever wanted to know. Um, so, but please, you know, think of your questions if you got any, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to make sure, uh, make sure I can explain it all. So, the, typically a vaccine takes 10 to 15 years from the time you have a novel virus to when you might have a product that you actually have FDA authorized or approved and be able to put in people's arms. 10 to 15 years is the normal timeline. And that, that's, that's whether it's measles or shingles, just go through all the list of other. We, flu vaccine is unusual in that we tinker with it a little bit each year. That's what, so it, it seems as if, don't be deceived by flu vaccine because we make a slight modification for the strain we're not reinventing and reapproving a vaccine each year. This just came out actually two days ago in STAT. Why COVID-19 vaccines are a freaking miracle. Um, so coincidentally, just, just came out. And, and here's the why. So just to develop the candidate, so the vaccine that you're going to try to test can often take years to identify a candidate. We've been working for decades to come up with an HIV AIDS vaccine candidate. Cancer vaccine candidates, same thing, years to try to get a possible candidate. Then what you do is phase one testing. This is the initial safety testing where you might put it in anywhere from 10 to 50 humans. That's called, that's, that's called entering the clinic. And you'll see that's basic testing for safety. You wanna just see is there some horrible adverse reaction coming from this vaccine so that you pull the plug on the program right away. That can take years to do. Then, because you have to find study volunteers and you have to get clinical trial, you have to get the vaccine manufactured in a small quantity to put it in people. Then you study that data and you may study it for quite a long time. And then you enter phase two, which is this, now you're starting to test it in more people, maybe, you know, maybe hundreds of people. You're continuing always throughout testing for, to look for safety. Now you're looking for efficacy. Is it doing its job? And you're also what's called studying dose ranging because ethically you want to administer the minimal quantity of a drug needed to secure the benefit. So you're studying different doses to find where on that efficacy curve is the sweet spot. But again, hundreds of subjects, two to three years to run those trials and study the results from them. Then you get to the big show. This is phase three. This is the part you usually hear about in the media. These are the definitive clinical trials. Normally a vaccine trial, five to 6,000, maybe 8,000 people in a vaccine trial. And this can be five to 10 years to do this. Why? Because with an infectious disease vaccine, how do you test it? You know, you don't, you, you don't give somebody a vaccine shot and then put some COVID under their nose and say, and test to see, did you get it? That's called a human challenge study. Ethically, unless you've got a therapy that can completely reverse COVID, it's not really ethical to do that, especially when you're having to test it in the people who are most vulnerable of serious illness and death. 
So the way we test vaccines, unlike therapeutics, therapeutics are easy-ish easy to, I mean, easy to test compared. Somebody gets sick, you give them the medicine, do they get better? You study that statistically. Vaccine, what you do is you take a population, in this case, let's say five to 6,000 people, half of them you give a placebo, basically a sugar water shot to, half of them you give vaccine, you say, go out into the world. And then you keep track of them, you monitor, you test them, and according to a pre-specified statistical endpoint based on the number of people in your study, eventually when you get a certain number of people infected that come back positive, you open the black box of the study, because you're blinded to all of this, you open the black box and you say, okay, 100 people, let's say the pre-specified endpoint for statistical significance is 100 infections. You open the box, you see of those 100 people, how many of the 100 infections were, in, were actually injected with the vaccine and how many got the sugar water. That's your determination of efficacy. That's, that's how you study it. So imagine that you're, you're having to take people, vaccinate, placebo, go out into the world and wait until enough people get infected and come back in. Then once you get that data, you've got to study it, statistical analysis, all of this, <clears throat> then it can take, you know, on average two years for the FDA to do a full approval package and study, study the information. Then you get to the other interesting part, which is, okay, great, you've got a vaccine that the FDA says is safe and effective, but you've got to move from just making a little quantity, maybe six, 7,000 doses, making hundreds of millions of doses of this. Oh, and it's not good enough just to make it and have it in a vat. You've got to do what's called fill and finish. You've got to put it in vials or in syringes, finish it off in a sterile way, and distribute it. So all of that process, 10 to 15 years on average. So why, why would one think that those timelines could be changed or accelerated? So first, was there a vaccinable target, as, as I'd say? Anyone know what the first vaccine ever in history was? Yes. We shouldn't have infectious disease specialists in the audience. There we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Smallpox. In the 1700s, so Jenner, who invented the first vaccine, basically noticed, as we do with so much of science, is just looking out and observing and seeing what's weird and trying to discern why is it weird. He noticed that milkmaids in the 1700s wouldn't get smallpox. And he said, why on earth would that be? And what he found was they were getting cowpox, and cowpox was close enough to smallpox that the antibodies that their body had produced against the cowpox, which was able to jump species, this cowpox, the antibodies could protect against and fight smallpox. But the cowpox was not a terribly serious thing for people to get, unlike smallpox. And so what they did is they would basically scrape off the pustules from the cows that were infected with cowpox, dry it out, take a variegated needle, looks like a pitchfork, dip it in that, and then jab you. That's why if you, sorry, that's why if you've seen the, the older folks who've had the smallpox vaccine, it's on your shoulder, it's a little circle that looks like a scar. That's the cowpox scar. And this was the tactic used for smallpox vaccination up until the 2000s. Like, literally, there were thousands and thousands of cows giving their all to make vaccine. I mean, that was, the, so that, think about that for hundreds of years. That's dry vax vaccine until we invented a chemically synthesized vaccine after 9-11. So that's vaccine. But a vaccine, but you have to have a target. I mentioned HIV AIDS before. We don't have a vaccine yet for that. What do we, what do we know so far about HIV AIDS? The human body, nobody's ever healed themselves of HIV. Their body has never been able to provoke an immune response to on its own heal itself. Whereas with COVID, the body can heal itself. People have recovered from COVID. That tells us something that's really important in the context of vaccines. It means the body can produce antibodies that are effective against COVID. That's a really important aspect of this that says that, that gets you a long way there. Because then what it says is like smallpox, if we can just trick your body into thinking you've gotten COVID but not get COVID, we can have you provoke these antibodies to protect you. See, the way it works is when you get sick from a novel virus that nobody's ever seen before, your, your body, body sees this foreign substance in it and says, I don't recognize that. It shouldn't be in the body, but I don't know how to deal with this. And it sends all the basic systems of our, of our, of our immune system against it. 
And eventually it figures out, okay, this, if we do this antibody, this will kill off that antigen. And it ramps up like this. Okay, so over time, you're you, start, you, you learn about it, you produce it, you produce those antibodies, et cetera. Well, what does a vaccine do? A vaccine tricks your body into thinking it's had COVID, produces those antibodies, and the B cell and T cells get memory and say, hey, when we see this again, it's not gonna take us so long. When we see this again, instead of going like this, the body getting sicker and sicker and sicker during that progression, our antibody production is gonna go like this. The minute we see COVID, we're gonna produce an antibody response to it. We're gonna stop or kill off that antigen before it can replicate a lot. So that's, that's basically how vaccines work. And that's why you go into this thinking, we've got something to work with here. And in fact, within just a couple of months, as a result, we had over 100 candidate vaccines against COVID. So then the other thing is, we spent $2 trillion of taxpayer money in March of 2020 to deal with the consequences of COVID, COVID relief, et cetera. So my thesis was, in talking with the team, no, effectively, any amount of money that you could credibly spend that would bring vaccines sooner to help us get out of this and help either prevent infection or reduce the risk of hospitalization for people, any amount of money you could credibly spend is gonna have an infinite return on investment. And so you've got, so you can say to the team, listen, don't be guided, I use this term, be guided only by the laws of science and physics. I don't know why I picked those two, but I said science and physics, and take money off the table. Because if we can come up with a thesis for how we can make this happen faster, we can secure any amount of money that we need to make this work. In addition, we had coming out of 9-11, some of the statutory changes were emergency use authorizations that allowed FDA to approve vaccines and drugs in an emergency um, on a more flexible standard than some of the normal two randomized clinical control trial standards and some of the other process changes um, that, that w process requirements that we would have. And then I had been in the Bush administration as um, uh, as Professor uh, Barabas re re referenced. One of the things we did there was the pandemic planning. So we were very nervous about pandemic flu in the Bush administration coming. And one of the challenges with flu was we had very limited flu vaccine production capacity in the United States. You all won't remember this, but in 2004, we actually had, a, we had one factory go down in Liverpool, England that left a, ma a huge shortage of flu vaccine in the United States in the fall of 2004. And so we actually did built an industrial planning system where we, the federal government, like World War II style, basically tried to create more production of flu vaccine here in the United States, which is grown in eggs. So again, a lot of chickens giving their all for, for the American people. Um, but instead of just that, also create what's called cell-based production, where you can cultivate and grow flu, the flu vaccine, in these big metal bioreactors on beds of feeder cells, hopefully infinite production, not subject to eggs. And it was actually those investments that allowed us, when we had H1N1 hit, to have a second dose for the pandemic on top of the annual flu was that extra capacity. So we had already experienced some of the, I'd been involved in these, how do you use the levers of government, money and otherwise, to incent domestic-based production that isn't gonna happen organically in the pharmaceutical marketplace. Then, um, as was mentioned, I spent 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry between the Bush administrations and then when I came into the Trump administration, getting exposure to the drug industry and how it works, how it does development, and most, and actually really importantly, manufacturing, how manufacturing works and just how difficult that can be. Um, the pharmaceutical, the joke about the pharmaceutical industry is that the pharmaceutical industry is the riskiest business on earth that attracts some of the most risk averse people on earth to it. Because think about it, every individual drug is a bet you're placing, a binary event of success that has a mi oftentimes microscopic chance of succeeding. So the way drug companies work is they assemble a portfolio of these risks and then they work on each individual one to de-risk the investment, so make each individual drug candidate as minimal investment as possible to learn more information before you invest any more money, and then a portfolio to minimize the risk across them. 
So understanding how that worked and what the, why things go so slowly in the drug industry was critical because then you can change those incentive structures. So we were investing in vaccines. In fact, we had uh, within days, three days of getting the genetic sequence, the researchers at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, Tony Fauci's group at NIH, had actually developed a vaccine candidate. They had been working with a company called Moderna on MERS vaccines before. And so they had a partnership already, a construct in place. They sent it over to Moderna. And eight weeks later, March 16th, the fastest in human history, the Moderna vaccine goes into that phase one clinical trials of humans, the first initial batch into humans. We also were investing in other vaccine platforms. One of them was Johnson & Johnson, <clears throat> which had uh, an interesting vaccine candidate. j and is, of course, a vaccine powerhouse. I had just been working with them on their Ebola vaccine in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo months before using the same platform. It's called the, I'll talk in a minute about the adenovirus platform. Well, we were going to put, the, the teams had arranged, we're going to put a half a billion dollars in. j and was putting half a billion dollars in. I talked to the CEO at the end of March about this. And I come in the next day and talk to the team, and I said, so from my understanding of that discussion, for all that money, the hope is the J&J &J vaccine will enter clinical trials in September, phase one, what Moderna had already done March 16th. I said, okay, that's not the most interesting to me, because, you know, SARS, MERS, Zika, these are things that were very serious at one point, but then they, of their own epidemiological curve, went down. I said, by September, Either we could be in real distress, and that's just phase one, or we, this could be over, in which case it's not as relevant. And so that's interesting. Um, I said, how much vaccine are we getting for this? How much is going to be manufactured? Well, that's not part of it. And I said, well, what price will we pay when eventually there's a vaccine? Well, that's not part of it. And I said, well, you know, at Lilly, if I wanted to invest in a phase three clinical trial, I had to go to the board of directors and a science and technology subcommittee of the board of Nobel laureates to get approval. I said, so what I'm going to do is I created this Secretary's Scientific Advisory Board with the, the, all the greats, you know, Francis Collins, Tony Fauci, the head of the FDA, the head of the CDC, the top career people at FDA, top career people at CDC, or head of emergency preparedness. Um, <clears throat> and what happened was just very quickly we could see that there was a great portfolio out there of vaccines, but the team came to me, especially two gentlemen, um, Peter Marks, who is the head of the vaccine center, the biologic center at the FDA, regulates vaccines. And Dr. Bob Cadlick, the assistant secretary for preparedness and response, basically runs emergency response at HHS. And they came and said, you know, Mr. Secretary, we can feel your frustration that these timelines, we're frustrated. Um, and we're just telling you, if we rely on the pharmaceutical industry's timelines, it'll be years, years, years before we see vaccines here. And they said, but we think there are ways to accelerate it. And I said, you know what? I agree. I think like we did with pandemic flu, we can have a Manhattan Project attitude, which is what if we take the full power of the US government, the full resources, the financial resources? I said, listen, look at this. Look at the, the infinite return on investment I talked about before. Take money off the table. Said, How could we compress these timelines if money was not an issue in any way? All risk of money gone. And how do we think about it in the way of the other great public-private partnerships? So, you know, the Manhattan Project, which in three, if we're the country, if in three years we can develop an atomic bomb, we can do a lot of things technologically. That was also a public-private partnership. That wasn't just a bunch of government scientists at Los Alamos doing that. That was government scientists at Los Alamos working with private sector people at the University of Chicago, University of California, I mean, all, Lawrence, all over the place. The Apollo project wasn't just NASA, it was NASA people working with General Dynamic, working with um, uh, Lockheed Martin, others to, to develop that, put a, you know, take a man to the moon uh, safely, return him and return him to Earth safely within eight years. If we can do that stuff, we can, we can think we can reconceive vaccine development and manufacturing to go faster. So we went into this approach uh, with a good friend of mine who's a professor of innovation and strategy at Tuck, he's here today, Professor Ron Adner. Professor Adner has a book called Wide Lens, which is basically when you have great innovation, how does it fail? Like, how does it not conquer the world? And he had actually come and trained our entire leadership team at HHS at the beginning of my tenure 
about how do, you, how do we do innovation and how do we think about um, all of the issues that can, a great regulatory innovation, what can stop it from happening and stop it from working, and got us in this mindset of thinking about basically assess every aspect in minute detail, every aspect of drug de vaccine development, manufacturing, distribution, administration. You go through and you map out every element, we call it, it's called, the military also calls it critical chain analysis. Every minute thing that has to happen to get from here to there, and you assess what can fail because of a lack of technical success, and, and then what can you do to mitigate, just like the drug companies do on individual projects, how can, what can you do to mitigate risk and then spread risk with multiple and redundant systems, which players in the ecosystem can delay action for failure to adopt this innovation? So think about who might not have the incentives to move as quickly as we need them to move, like a drug company. The drug company doesn't lo want to lose money on a vaccine that, that, that doesn't work in phase two. They don't want to have invested $800 million preparing for a phase three clinical trial if at the end of phase two, the, drug, the vaccine disappears because it didn't work or it wasn't safe. I mean, even when you think you've got a, a, a very likely drug, oftentimes the human body's a mystery. Um, you can see off-target safety effects that were totally unpredictable. So change the incentive structure so that they, they don't get in the way of that, but actually work with you. And then this is probably a bit more even Six Sigma language, which is how do you minimize execution risk by first minimize novelty? Use what already works, leverage that, reduce new steps, reduce steps in any process and system, reduce variability, just repeatable engines that run constant at the same rate are gonna be more reliable than ones, that's, than ones that start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. So build your system for repeatable, um, uh, re to minimize execution risk and error. So there really were 10 key, I'm sorry, seven key problems that we had to solve in order to get vaccines early. First was, as with any kind of business or leadership problem, vision and buy-in. You've gotta set the vision, but people have to buy into that and believe if they're on the team that it can actually happen. Second, it's all about the people. You've gotta get the right people, but you've also gotta make sure you've got the, comp the organizational competencies that can deliver on this challenge. Third is execution risk. Minimize, just as I said before, any variability that can create a, that can create you to fall off that track, um, because things bad things happen. If people fail to execute, um, challenges occur. How, you can mitigate against that. Fourth is development risk. That issue of what happens with the if a drug just you know doesn't work at phase two. Commercial scale manufacturing risk. How do you scale up from small production to huge production? Because that's usually invested in once you know you actually have a drug, a vaccine that works. Uh, six, commercial risk is, you know, these, these are not, you know, nonprofit entities. How do you ensure that they're gonna wanna come to like the field of dreams, you know, if, uh, if you build it, they will come. Um, how do you, even if you do all these other things, if there's not a market, they're not gonna come. And then finally, distribution risk. How do you think ahead of, once you have this, that's great, but how do you get it out there? So, on vision and buy-in. So BHAG, for those non-business school students, um, Jim Collins, his famous book, this is called A Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. Leaders set BHAGs, Big, Hairy, Audacious Goals for an Organization. I have another thing which is in, 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 uh, in Covey's, Steve Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. My favorite habit is the one, the second habit, which is begin with the end in mind. Articulate and know the goal. I used another framing of this, which I'm not a sports aficionado, so I did not know at the time, and I've since publicly apologized to Wayne Gretzky for this. Um, I used to always say that you fail to achieve 100% of the goals you do not set. I was later told Wayne Gretzky was the one who said that you miss every shot you don't take. But it is, it's this point, you're, you're not gonna get some incredible advancing of vaccine timelines if, you, if it's secret, it's just a secret goal I keep in your head. And so, articulate a goal. A BHAG, FDA authorized vaccines by the end of 2020 with enough vaccines for every American by the beginning of 2021. Then the question is, you know, are you, are you just the guy standing out on the street corner saying this and everyone's looking at you like, cra you know, like you're crazy? Or have you brought people along with you on this journey to say, yeah, you know what, we, we're buying into that. Um, and so 
one of the critical things was, how do you get the rest of the government, the rest of the agency, the rest of the government to say, you know what, it, it, this, isn't, this isn't silly. Um, and so what I did was I reached out to many of my cabinet colleagues, Defense Department, Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security, um, Agriculture, which does veterinary countermeasures, the Energy Department, which has the biggest supercomputers on Earth, and secured buy-in saying, um, we ought to do this. We need to work together. I don't care who leads it. It's just somebody should be doing this. We've got the money, and we'll find any money we need. And we believe there's a path where we could advance these timelines on developing the drug, getting it approved, getting manufactured, and getting it distributed and out. Um, but we need to all be together. We need to leverage all the resources of the government. Um, now, setting that kind of a goal, uh, that's really good business practice, especially get your team aligned. This is what you do as business leaders. It's not great politics um, because, you know, puts a target out there. And I, I'm, I don't say this by means of gloating. These are very credible, important people. And, but they, they were very clear that, you know, Dr. Fauci, my good friend, um, I said we could have one by the end of the year. Uh, could, not would, could. Dr. Fauci said 12 or even 18 months. And Paul Offit on CNN said, well, when Dr. Fauci said 12 to 18 months, I think he was being ridiculously optimistic, and I, I think he did, I'm sure he did too. Um, Dr. Plotkin at University of Pennsylvania, I'd say it's a matter of two years minimum, one of my favorites. Vaccine by the end of the year, in your view, is that possible? Asked Brian Williams on MSNBC. And response from a nat the National Center of Disaster Preparedness, it's another day of POTUS in Wonderland, it's preposterous. Okay, so this was, this was the reaction, which is, you know, this can't be done. It's never been done before. Why would you even tease, like, the idea that we could have within seven months of this announcement vaccines that are approved by the FDA and have vaccines that you could actually be putting in people's arms at that point? Um, that's not great politics. Like, it, it's good business, but putting those kind of markers out there, even as a potential, and I learned an important thing, which is the media doesn't deal with the conditional or subjunctive case in language very well. So you say could, hope, possible. Somehow those things disappear, and those become a promise and a commitment and a man, you know, it's going to happen. Um, but then, and yet, seven months later, minus four days, vaccine with 36 million doses re releasable for the American public in that timeline. So continuing on, people and organizational capabilities. So a public-private model with people, which is, where's the best talent? We got a lot of great talent in the US government. But you're talking about something that you have some of the world's largest industries doing, which is vaccine development and manufacturing. And if you think you can just look inside in the government to do this in a historic and changing way, I don't think that's possible. So look to the model of the Manhattan Project, World War II drug development, when George Merck developed antibiotics and all these products for, 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 the, for the military, when citizen, sort of citizen scientists come in and help the US in times of crisis, um, the Apollo Project, the same. But you have to define the problems. You have to, again, begin with the end in mind. What are the problems from a human capital perspective we had to solve? The first was we have to accelerate development. The second is we've got to scale manufacturing. And the third is HHS is an amazing cabinet department. It's got unbelievable scientists and health professionals. But it's not the world's leading logistics operations and procurement organization, OK? That's, like, that's sort of project management, et cetera. We need a solution for that. And so you got to find a leader for each. So in, in Manhattan Project terminology, I needed my Oppenheimer, and I needed my Leslie Groves. You ever heard of Leslie Groves? Unsung hero. Leslie Groves ran the Manhattan Project. He was the general at the Pentagon who actually ran and orchestrated all the logistics operations and everything else of the Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer was the genius with the scientists and everyone, but not without the being combined with Leslie Groves, the gentleman on the left, none of it would have actually materialized and come to fruition in any relevant timeline. So find those people, and we did. Um, and then cross-government, I'll, I'll get back to the people, cross-government collaboration. So I will tell you none of this could have happened without Mark Esper as Secretary of Defense. 
I have never seen a level of openness and collaboration from another cabinet department, especially the Defense Department. I called Secretary Esper on April 25th to raise this idea of this whole of government approach, and he immediately said, I'm in, I get it, but you need us. You need the Defense Department. You guys have all these brains, you've got the smart health people, but the DOD, we know how to, we, we know how to make stuff happen. And he said, I've got the right person. He had my Leslie Groves, the leader of this, a three-star and then four-star general named Gus Perna, who was the head of US Army Materiel Command. Imagine what it takes to logistically move the United States Army into a battle theater. Like, all the things you have to think about make happen from latrines to mess to armaments to personnel, everything. This is the guy that does all that, in charge of all that. I mean, the world's leading logistician and project manager and Secretary Esper gave him to us to lead Operation Warp Speed. Then on the development side, found Monsef Slawi, who was the, had been the longtime head of research and development at GSK, the big vaccine manufacturer. He developed and brought across the finish line more vaccines than anyone in modern history. So this guy knew how, he knew the timelines. And I sat with him and I said, can we do it? Can we get FDA approved vaccine, authorized vaccines by the end of the year and produce them in time? And he said, you know what? Everything has to work perfectly. A million things can go wrong but there is a path. And he saw the vision and said, yes, it can be done. And then an unsung hero, Carla Di Notari Stefani, who had been the head of manufacturing, global manufacturing at the big drug company, Bristol Myers Squibb, and then at the world's leading generic company, Teva. He came on board with all that manufacturing expertise. So those three, absolutely critical. <clears throat> so execution risk, what can go wrong? Um, build an organization that's really protected. So, Report just to the president. So try to minimize bureaucracy. We created a separate Operation Warp Speed board that was me and the Secretary of Defense and Dr. Burks as the who ran everything COVID for the US government um, and Jared Kushner as senior advisor to the president who could help ensure that basically interference in the team was helped, the team was helped to be protected and, uh, and barriers cleared. And you do what a good board does, oversight and accountability. You um, basically empower, you enable the team, but with, you remove barriers that they may face, and you protect them from any type of interference or unnecessary bureaucracy. I mean, think about how interesting this project is. These guys, this team, could have been sitting in White House briefings, media briefings, 24 hours a day, not getting their job done. So actually, how do you build a cone of protection of them so they can actually focus and especially ensure that speed of decision making and no political, inter no political interference. We actually, I, I had the model of co-locate them, pull everyone together, so no, don't do this virtually. We co-located them, the Los Alamos model, out in the middle of the desert. Um, we, we ended up uh, putting them on the seventh floor of the Humphrey Building, uh, not quite the desert, but we had everyone together, co-located and protected. Then there's development risk. So we talked about this, the pharmaceutical model, which is put a lot of bets on the table and minimize risk collectively by doing that. Then there are three different ways, at least three, but there were three main ways to deliver a vaccine. Invest in each of them. So down here at the bottom, protein subunit. This is the traditional way you do, you do vaccines. So basically, that's the measles vaccine. The, the thing, the protein, the part of, so you take the protein that is in the antigen that causes your body to say, this is measles, this is, this is COVID, and you take a subunit of that that is enough for the body to recognize, but not enough that it gives you measles or COVID, and you just replicate that in bioreactors. Grow it, grow it, grow it, grow it, grow it, grow it, filter it, extract it, put it in the body, and the body reacts to that floating in the blood, produces antibodies, you, you know, it thinks you had COVID, okay? The challenge is you have to produce a lot of that stuff because that's, that's literally what you put in is what you get. And so you produce a lot of it and you add to it these, they're called adjuvants, which is various chemicals that can get your body to be really sensitive to a foreign body to try to provoke the response. That's the traditional way it's always been, that's usually been done. The other approach in the middle is adenovirus. This is a common cold version. There's one that's a chimpanzee common cold, another that was an infant common cold version. You basically take the virus and you add to it the, um, the, the protein and it goes into the body 
and of course, it's, it's not the full adenovirus because you don't get a common cold from it. It goes in, it goes to the cell, it sends messenger RNA out to the cell, the cell then produces these spike proteins, which is the, the subunit protein, the spike protein on the surface of the cell, the body sees it, recognizes it, goes to town making antibodies. Basically turns your cells at the provocation of the virus into manufacturing facilities. So instead of being stuck with just what you inject, you inject the body, the virus replicates, the virus goes into the cells, the cells produce these spike proteins, the spike proteins cause you to produce antibody. That was J&J's like, J Ebola vaccine, that kind of platform. And then the novel one was this messenger RNA. You cut out all those middlemen, and you basically messenger RNA these instructions. You send the instructions in. They're coated in an oily lipid, like an envelope to protect it so your body doesn't kill the mRNA when it goes in. They go in, and they basically send the direction directly to the cells, produce these spike proteins. Spike proteins get produced, antibody response. Never been done before, though. Mind you, this was, they, that had never been proven before. Um, so invest in three technologies and do so in a redundant way. So we had the Pfizer BioNTech for mRNA, we invest, and we had Moderna, two candidates there. Adenovirus, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca were using that platform. And then protein subunit, Novavax, and a Sanofi GSK one. So again, diversify your risk. And then this was the key on development. <clears throat> Take that risk off the table. Just fully fund it up front. Just say, you know what? We got it. You fund, we're gonna do phase three planning when we're still in fa beginning phase two. And yes, this vaccine may completely fail. And all that money may have been wasted and effort may have been wasted, but that's on us. You drug company, we, uh, we got that. Because we, we need speed here. And we're willing to assume that risk. So fund all of that right up front. The other way to speed it is remember I talked about how you do vaccine trials. Half people get the sugar water, half people get the vaccine, the vaccine you go out into the community. Well, statistically, the more people you have in the trial, you know, the more likely you're gonna get hits of people getting, getting, getting infected the sooner you get to your statistical endpoint. So big trials, 40,000 people in these trials, some of the largest vaccine trials ever in human history because we could fund that. And it was bad that in June, July, August, September of 2020, you may remember, cases were exploding, you know, especially in the South. Bad for human health, bad for the immediate conditions, good for clinical trials. Because what we did is we would mobilize with the Defense Department, and as outbreaks were happening, we'd move clinical trial sites. We'd go, okay, Jacksonville's got, got a huge outbreak. We, we send teams down there and start vaccinating people there. Bozeman, Montana, go to Bozeman. You know, so just constantly redeploying. That's where having the military involved is so important, that nimbleness and operational capability to take advantage of that. And with that many people, it took only weeks to actually get the statistically significant number of hits of infections. Another critical element, clinical trial diversity, in a way that has never been focused on with such consciousness before. As you know, the, the burden of COVID-19 has had a very disproportionate impact on minority communities, especially African-American, Hispanic, and the American Native and Alaska Native populations. Clinical trials often are very unrepresentative because cl just, just, they're clinical, the whole clinical trial machinery in our country is not well attuned to recruiting and retaining a diverse population in it. We, so this is Dr. Francis Collins, NIH, Tony Fauci, Jerome Adams, the Surgeon General. Every Saturday, they were on holding accountability sessions with vaccine companies about their clinical trial diversity enrollment, holding their feet to the fire, coming up with plans for enhancing that. And at the end of the day, 10% African-American, 26% for Pfizer, 20% Moderna Hispanic. And then on the American Native, Alaska Native, Pfizer and Moderna, all, all within range of representative or better than representative populations. Levels of clinical trial diversity we haven't seen before, um, but that was a very conscious, deliberate focus that didn't happen by accident. Manufacturing risk, these are bioreactors. So, you need, to, you need to go from like a 20 liter bioreactor to make those 40, 50,000 doses of vaccine to making 100 million doses in 2,000 bio liter, bio, 2000 liter bioreactors. You think that's a math problem, okay, you just scale. No, um, 
Biologics and proteins, as Dr. Slowey says, they're moody. They're living things. They have an attitude, and you have to cultivate them. You have to give them feeder cells they eat off of. What do they eat? What do they like? What will cause them to grow enough? And then will they be pure? How do you, how do you filter and purify to extract? Um, we had one instance where uh, there was, when you scaled and you filtered, the, the foam created a hydrostatic barrier, blocked up the filters, and you lost a lot. So it, you couldn't predict that. No engineer in the world could have predicted it. So trial and error. Um, we stood up 27 separate manufacturing fill finish facilities less than seven months to do this. We had to secure materials using the Defense Procurement Act. Um, and we had one instance where a pump broke in a manufacturing facility. DOD found the pump on a train, deployed the military out, stopped the train, extracted the pump, got it in the factory within 24 hours up and running again. It would have taken months normally. Again, that's where that combination works. We put military people in these factories so we had eyes on and were able to help and have visibility into everything that was going on to help immediately. Commercial risk, so SARS, MERS, and Zika, I mentioned, they all went up and then they went down for reasons we can't fully explain. A lot of drug companies had been burnt investing in vaccines for these programs because you invest a lot of money and it goes, well, there's no market for it. So you have to create a market because this could happen here. Guarantee, so it's not enough to fund development, it's you gotta make sure that someone's gonna be there to buy the stuff. So we guaranteed the purchase of 900 million doses with options for another 2.1 billion doses across those six manufacturers. And be flexible, meet them where they are. A small biotech needs much more capital support on an ongoing basis than a giant pharmaceutical company which may need just to know that you're there and guaranteed to buy it at the end of the day. So distribution risk, you know, the old saying, for one of a kingdom, for one of a nail, a kingdom was lost. Well, doesn't do much good to have, as I said, vaccine in a vat. We had to secure in the spring of 2020 a billion needles. So we had to buy syringes, uh, glass vials, rubber stoppers, the diluent that makes the, the dried vaccine come back to life, et cetera. That all you have to plan out in May of 2020 when we were announcing Operation Warp Speed. But then back to that execution principle. Leverage what works. Don't try to invent the world anew. We have got the world's leading drug distributors. We used McKesson because they did the Children for Vaccine program. These folks, this is, you know, this cold supply chain product, you can, they, they know how to get it anywhere in the country with no, with no to minimal risk on shipment and tracking everything else. We've got the world's leading uh, transportation companies, UPS and FedEx, which do much more than get your Amazon products to you. They do a lot of extremely complex logistics and movement. Leverage that. And then who to vaccinate? You know, there was this sort of thing about, well, you should have the military go out and vaccinate. We do 100 million vaccinations every year in this country through hospitals, public health departments, doctors, nurses, and our pharmacies. And leverage that. Um, you can find to have other, other approaches, but don't try to reinvent what already exists. And then ship it all in a box. Keep it simple. Put everything you need all together. Take all that variability out so it's all there and ready. And vaccine track. We developed a whole new vaccine tracking system, linked the 50,000 vaccination locations around the country. So the results, you know, two vaccines in December 2020 with some of the most robust data behind them. Very safe, very, very effective. A third J&J &J vaccine approved in the Biden administration in February 2021. We had 36 million releasable doses of vaccine. You had tens of millions more that had been produced in de by December, but they basically have to go through the sterility and quality control check that takes about six weeks. So they were there, they just couldn't be released. 99.9% .9 on time delivery and performance, and we were up to 1.5 million vaccinations a day at the time of the transition. And by the second quarter, we had more vaccine than people want, were willing to use. So some lessons learned. First, key part, it's all, it, it was so about partnership. Um, that interagency partnership, especially DOD, this public-private partnership, and then also we didn't talk much about state-federal partnership. The org design, speed of decision-making. Um, making sure once you make a decision, you stick with it so the team knows they can put that in the bank, and no politics. Keep team insulated, this is about science, about execution, um, operations. The we need better systems for how to bring the world's leading experts in to work with the government. I mean, 
the government ethics rules and everything are important, but we need to figure out good systems where we can, in a crisis, leverage the best talent in the world for the, to help us. There's a motto in business, you know, the perfect being the enemy, enemy of the good. Um, it's very careful, especially on distribution, to not try to over-prioritize from the center, to micromanage. When you're out in the real world, when you try to decide who's going to get vaccinated by a certain job code, um, that gets messy in the world of execution. And sometimes it's better to, we also just say the 80-20, get 80% right, 20%, and, and not try to fight on the other 20%. Um, that's where we ended up by January 20th, just saying over 65, get vaccinated, under 65 with comorbidity, get vaccinated. Sort of keep it simple, for, because remember, this is execution that has to happen at the line level. Managing public expectations. Um, I think one thing we could have done a better job is sort of under, underselling, underpromise, and overdeliver. We're all excited. This is a historic event, historic opportunity, and there were things that were going to go wrong. Launching a new distribution system is going to be, is going to be messy. Um, the, the concept of flow, people don't understand that manufacturing is flow. It's not just a moment in time. And you're tr you have to build a systems to account for that. And you want to make sure you're not doing vaccinations like this, and then down, and this, and then down, because that's error. That, that introduces error into the system. Nursing homes, it just took weeks. They had to opt into Walgreens and CVS to vaccinate in nursing homes. And then the Walgreens and CVS had to go hire people to go and do those vaccinations. So it took a little bit of time. By a month and a half, all these things were humming, but would have been good, better if we could have been more, listen, this is going to be creaky. This is going to, you know, they're going to be things that are going to be a little slower than you'd like, but we're on the way. And then, of course, vaccine hesitancy. We had focused a lot on traditional groups of vaccine hesitant groups. Could have done more, but you know, with only seven months there, we did a lot. But then there were newly hesitant groups. I've been as surprised as anyone by pockets of vaccine hesitancy in this country that we've never seen before. Um, I don't have a silver bullet for that. I do think it's important to speak to people, to educate them, to, edu to, to give them information, to make choices. Um, and especially to have trusted sources of authority in any community that people are going to actually find credible information from with good, of course, quality information. But that's been a, that's been a real challenge and surprise. Um, we need to have this funding. We were lucky we had the funding, but we need funding for this in the future. Could you do this for other disease states? Maybe, sure. But um, cancer and Alzheimer's, that's not the same as having a defined vaccinable target like we talked about at the beginning. Um, you need to know what you're executing against. If you've got it proven this, that this could work and it's just about execution, then I think Operation Warp Speed can work, definitely. Um, but at the end, um, if you want to challenge these kind of perspectives, um, you've got to have an ex a lot of external experiences because you're taking, you have to be willing to, courageous, take a lot of, a lot of risk, but you have to have seen outside of the paradigm to challenge that paradigm. The, the other is the public sector can learn a lot from the private sector, but the private sector can also learn from the public and the ability to do things. And bottom line always is if you put the right, it's all about the right people being in place. Without those people I mentioned, none of this would have happened. So thank you very much. So that was, I feel like I relived uh, the last two years and, and really gained new appreciation for it. I guess that, that leads to the first, first question I want to ask is government in general has a very bad reputation. And you've cited your early examples, World War II drug development, Apollo project, um, you know, the, the, the other things that we were doing with respect to the Manhattan project. Those were all really good visible projects that I think in some way engendered some sort of positive feelings about the government mm -hmm. kind of coming together. That's, that's been one of my chief um, things that I've been wondering about with respect to the pandemic and the governmental response is why we haven't seen sort of renewed interest in, in the government, especially with, with such a you know, visible achievement mm -hmm. um, after, after this much time. So I was just wondering if you could comment a bit on what, what hope this has for people in, believing in, in government. So I, I do hope Operation Warp Speed and especially the vaccine efforts will inspire that and will be repeatable and replicated in future situations where 
when the U.S. government has immense power, not just money, but say the Defense Production Act, the ability to order the entire economy, to basically decide who gets bioreactors, who gets sterile tubing. That's, it's comprehensive authority across the United States. Um, those powers are incredible. They have to be applied where there's the political will to apply them, but you can do incredible things. But the key is not alone. It's actually with leveraging the private sector. I think on the broader response, the challenge has been, you know, there's no, no pandemic is going to be, uh, that's, 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 there's no circumstance where that is an edifying thing. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately, you know, people, the, by its nature, by its definition, individuals get sick, individuals die. It's just, it's a tragedy in every respect. So warp speed is this bright light of action that grants hope, delivers solutions, compared to like the broader, which is, um, you know, it's just pandemics or something one hmm. doesn't, you know, it's not, <laughs> yeah, so, not uh, so I guess positive. <laughs> this, is, this leads into the question of, are, are public-private partnerships more appropriate for some issue areas than others? So the space race, for example, you know, and, or, you know, beating the, you know, Axis powers with, with uh, the atomic weapon. So you mentioned other possibilities mm -hmm. of, of public-private partnerships related to cancer or other, other medical applications. So I was wondering about the space, you know, we've got companies yeah. right now, SpaceX and whatnot, Blue Origins. Oh, yeah. So you, you see, you see ex examples there. Mm -hmm. You see, even in the Great Recession, the government's response there, helping mm -hmm. the automaker. So you have, you have examples of the government stepping in in a very visible way in oh, yeah. diff across different policy areas. I was just wondering if, if there's any particular area that's most ripe and appropriate for these kinds of solutions. So I, I, I think it's, first you need the political will. There's gotta be a situation where there's a desire to spend the money, use the political resources, around it, but um, I think of it in economic terms, I'll probably misuse it, where you have mar either market failure or a need to compensate for lack of market incentives. So where the government has a unique role. Um, let me give you one example, antibiotics. You know, we don't develop new antibiotics because nobody's, the countries that need the antibiotics can't pay for them. Um, so no, com no companies are investing in antibiotics. That would be a great role for governments to invest significant money to buy and to give them to countries where needed because the market's not producing them and will not. You can do the math. It won't happen absent a change in incentive structure or in Professor Adner's terms, you know, on the adoption chain. There's a negative. You need to turn to at least a neutral or a positive. Excellent. So uh, we've had some questions roll in and I want to leave some time for the audience uh, to also ask some questions. Let me ask one. Um, so if, if vaccines are so effective, why are we still, why do we still need masks? Uh, yeah. Was there something else that we should have done another operation to, to get out ahead of this, to pre possibly prevent these, these variants? Um, that's so let, so um, let, let's remember the, vac the vaccines remain exceedingly effective, especially at that core endpoint of preventing hospitalization and serious illness. And that, that is life-changing and life-saving. But we, we need vaccination. We need more people to get vaccinated. We also need testing and treatment. So treatment was another arm of warp speed. We had monoclonal antibodies, convalescent plasma. We now have some oral therapies that I really hope will get out there. Um, if, if you can get to where you vaccinate, you test, you have a readily accessible, easily usable pill, say, um, to, treatment, so, to treat so people feel if I get sick, I'm okay, I've been both, first I've mitigated by vaccination, secondly, I can treat. I think that type of combination really moves you forward. I think already, and I'm a, believe me, I'm, I was the leading public advocate around masks. I think we're, as a country, you get pandemic fatigue, you get mitigation. I talked about this in February, 2020, you get mitigation fatigue. There are points where you ask people too much. And to be honest, we may have a next variant. There was a great, piece in, uh, in, in, in a publication recently that said, it may be time to pull back on some of these things like masks because we may get a new variant where we need people to step up again. And if we keep running them at full speed on mitigation actions, um, they may not be willing to cooperate when we need them again. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that you have to think about as, a gov as government leaders or as institutional leaders. Absolutely. So uh, why don't we see if there are any questions in the audience and if you have them, please, there's, there's going to be uh, students with microphones coming, and I'll let them recognize people. But if you could state your name uh, clearly, you're, if you're affiliated with Dartmouth College, uh, give us your class year uh, for the questions. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is um, Osesley Okaru. I'm a class of 2022. I'm a biomedical engineering major. Uh, I think I asked you a question earlier today. So uh, looking back at your role at HHS uh, 0203, when you were able to see, uh, you know, the response to SARS, uh, what lessons were learned? Like, did you see other people learn? I know you were general counsel then, but what lessons did you see there and how did that impact your choices you made later on when you had the role of uh, secretary? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the critical lessons the World Committee to learn was the absolute importance of transparency. Um, as a World Committee, we've, we've, we've got to have complete transparency around these infectious diseases wherever they occur in the world. Unfortunately, I don't think we, we saw that in, in, this, in this case from, from China initially. Um, because you have to learn, you have to learn. There, there are critical things you need to know. How much does it transmit asymptomatically or do you have people carrying? Is, is it droplet or can it aerosolize? What are the best treatment patterns? This is where um, the working together internationally, we need to actually be, these are all of our problems. It's not one country's problem to try to solve. Um, and that was one of the most important things out of SARS was the transparency levels really weren't there. We're, we're hopeful this time they were better. It wasn't much better. Um, it also, I mean, just from a personal perspective, the SARS experience, when, when I hear the word new coronavirus, that immediate for me as a leader, I mean, my team could wrap, but I could immediately know the gravity of the situation, that we're dealing with something potentially, not guaranteed, potentially an extremely serious public health threat when you, when you look at a novel, a novel coronavirus. We've got some more questions, I think, hands. Um, Blake, it might be up to you to recognize somebody. There you go. Hi there. Uh, my name is Kyle. Um, and I'm in a health politics and policy class here at Dartmouth. I'm a senior. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question about the sort of the intersection between politics and policy here because you've laid out a vision in your talk today of public-private partnerships, of trust in institutions, of trust in leaders like, I'll pick on Dr. Anthony Fauci, but on, on, on people like that. Um, and that to me doesn't strike me as particularly prominent in today's Republican Party. Um, we see the demonization of people like Dr. Fauci. We see, um, you know, a, a very major distrust of how the government can step in. So what does the future, I mean, you've, you've served in a Republican administration. What does the future of, a, of the Republican Party look like on healthcare policy? So I don't know fully. Um, I, hope it's, I hope it's one that I hope I've represented, which is that we, we, we care for the health and well-being of everybody. Um, that when we respond, it's transparent, radically transparent, that we, um, we try to use every lever of the government in ways like this we talked about to help in every way possible. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn and, um, you know, a good, lear a good organization is a learning organization, even week by week, you're seeing where things aren't working, you try to adjust, you try to improve. Um, so from a public health perspective, improving our data systems, um, improving the coordination around diagnostics. The industry is very fragmented. Can we coordinate that better? Um, can you create a permanent fund so that it's available for the first few months of any type of public health crisis without intervention by Congress for response, preparedness, and countermeasure, early countermeasures development like what we had here um, to make that more predictable? Um, streamlined approval processes, lessons from how do you institutionalize Operation Warp Speed because, you know, you may not have someone running HHS or in a key leadership role who's seen the inside of drug development and been there for an earlier Manhattan Project style thing and be able to merge that. How do you institutionalize things like that? Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't know all the future on this has been the, the politics around this as a, frankly, more of a technocratic person has been different for me. We, we are uh, already over time, but let's see if we can get a few more questions in. Um, and some of the ones that come in online, you've, you've addressed through your comments. Uh, so uh, do we have some comments over here. Let's go to the side of the room. Hi, uh, my name is Lily, and I'm also a senior here at Dartmouth. And I'm also in the health politics and policy class with Kyle. Um, and I was just kind of wondering, like, and I, I know you said that the politics part of it is sort of difficult, um, but after seeing how successful um, it was to have so many people get vaccinated at once and try to increase access across the board, um, 
did that change your views at all on like health care politics in general and who should be receiving health care um, and how? No, I mean, so we, you do see with like say single payer integrated systems like the UK, when you have a national health service, they were able to leverage that, you know, very effectively for speed. Um, we leveraged ours for speed. We were actually leading every other country in speed of vaccination, of a major, all the major countries except maybe the UK, um, because we, we do have, it, it, it is a, it is, our system is, has complexity because of the multiple players in it, but it's actually very highly efficient and can be, can be very customer centric. You know, players like, you know, I get my flu vaccine at a pharmacy. Um, why build something new to replace a system that actually is highly effective, does 180 million vaccinations a year, um, and leverage, leveraging that? Um, I, I don't think that causes one to rethink the nature of care delivery overall, at least not for me. It doesn't change, change my views on whether we're better having a more patient-centric, market-based system in healthcare, but again, ensuring that people who need access to care have access to affordable care and we have financing mechanisms to enable those people to get that access, which is a core belief set of mine politically in healthcare. The vehicle may be different. You and I may have different views about the role of government in that or what the efficient economic mechanisms are for that, but share the goal, I think share the goal of that we want to make sure that to happen. But vaccinations, we actually, until we hit some of the roadblocks around he some of the hesitancy, we had one, one, one aspect of hesitancy also that we didn't foresee when the CDC wanted to do um, healthcare providers. Um, one of the, part of that was, was signaling. The thinking being, if you have healthcare providers get vaccinated, that signals to their patients, hey, I did it, just like I did it on TV, I did it, you should too. Um, we did see in those early days, it surprised us, among uh, women of childbearing age, which is obviously a large population of healthcare providers, a significant um, hesitancy, because in clinical trials, you don't, uh, you, you don't usually do studies in pregnant women. That's not, you know, it's because of the, the extra risk there, you don't usually do studies. We've now had, of course, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of women of childbearing age and have been able to see the large real world evidence safety profile. But that actually was a bit of, that was a surprise for all of us, I think, that hesitancy um, that, that actually slowed some of those efforts. And then we saw these novel pockets of hesitancy that arose sort of in the late January, February onward timeframe that again slowed. But we were cooking, we were up to over three million vaccinations a day. We were, um, and regardless of you know, whether you have an NHS or a market-based, more complex, it seems messier, but system. These systems questions are interesting, as well as when you look comparatively other countries, especially some of the Asian countries, Singapore, mm -hmm. Taiwan, where there's, they have other tools at their disposal, right. shall we say, or mm -hmm. different orientation between right. the citizenry and, yeah. and, and then the government officials. So you, mm -hmm. you may not have had quite the, quite the freedom right. to, to, to <laughs> essentially dictate those, those solutions. Uh, Right here. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a senior here. I study history and biology, and I have two uh, interrelated questions. One, what are your thoughts on making vaccines more available worldwide? And two, what are your thoughts on releasing vaccine patents? So on, on making vaccine available more worldwide, um, from day one, that's been my goal. I, they're, they're, we, we knew we were, hopefully, if we had hits, going to have a surplus of vaccine and I very much wanted to, and I'm very happy the Biden administration very quickly moved to a plan of getting vaccine out to the rest of the world through various vehicles for making that happen. That's absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, on the patent issue, um, the, I'm not a supporter of this notion of the breaking of the patents in part because that's not the barrier. The, the, the reason we, it, it's a production and manufacturing issue, that's not actually, even the Europeans are saying that's sort of a solution in search of a problem. Um, we, we have the companies are, will work with us and are willing to do the out licensing, the, the trade, because the issue actually, it's not the, it's, the, it's the trade secret and the manufacturing processes and manufacturing capacity for that to happen. Um, I think these issues of access, we've already vaccinated out of the world population, I think what, 4 billion? Um, so the production is, is, is definitely progressing. I don't think that breaking patents solves, I mean, it doesn't, I don't believe solves the manufacturing, the tech transfer, the trade secret, the manufacturing, all of those issues. 
um, and could be a significant barrier to innovation in the future. Um, that, that's, where I, that's where I stand on that one. Like I said, we are more than 10 to 15 <laughs> minutes past our time. Let's see if we can get one more question. Is there a final question? Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm a 25. Um, Me too. Oh. Oh, my they were the same, same simultaneous. They were photo finish from the, uh, from the Olympics. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Um, I was just curious if you could take us into a little bit some of the day-to-day -day negotiations with these pharma companies to get these doses, especially considering the kind of competing interests of vaccinating this very wealthy country against some of the concerns about being able to distribute the vaccine globally as quickly as possible. So I, I can't go into you know, blow by blow on, obviously, on negotiations, but um, at the end of the day, we had the authority, the Defense Production Act. And so, but you, that's, that can be overstated. You, there, having that authority enables one to work more collaboratively because at the end of the day, they know you have the ability to do things. Um, and negotiations were tough, but you know, we ended up, I mean, if you, look at the, if you look at the pricing, I mean, compared to, like, say, a shingles vaccine, which is, I think, about 180 bucks, I think the pricing works out, this is all public, I think pricing works out close to about 20 bucks a dose, if I remember correctly. Um, so, you know, very, mark, if you look at just general market, you know, very much within that, uh, could have been, you know, could you get a slightly lower number, like, say, Europe, got some European countries got somewhat lower, but as a result, they lost months by that. And so it's, always, it's a balance of speed on that. Um, the best thing I could do for the rest of the world was get manufacturing, get capacity, get the data packages, and get approvals, and have a surplus for whoever's president to then make available in the world. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's been proven correct by some of the international collaboratives that it took a, I mean, they're just now starting, I think, to deliver, whereas we were in surplus status as of April of this year. Oh, no, I'm sorry, April of 2021. And that enabled efforts to give away. There's a fascinating story here on so many different levels, the public policy side, the, you know, the technology side, we, we could, probably fill many, many evenings uh, talking about all of this. So um, I think we're, though, out of time, and so I'm going to uh, call it uh, a day on this particular topic. Thank all of you for, for joining us. I should also say this was the last uh, event for the Rockefeller Center this term. We have one co-sponsored event next tomorrow um, with the Dickey Center, the Freedom House President, Michael Abramowitz, um, tomorrow at 4.30, and Alderman 041. Uh, on reversing the tide, can we support democracy and counter authoritarianism? Uh, but this has been a, a, a very important way to, to wrap up this particular term. It is, you know, sort of everybody here at Dartmouth experienced, you know, the, the, the importance of the uh, warp speed and also the, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic as well. So we know that this is uh, among the most important topics we have to discuss. And th thank you for thank you. everything thank that you've Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.